spare his son, but he can't Lord, we bless you, Lord. Oh, we magnify the name of the Lord our God. We bless you, Lord. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Oh, God, welcome. God, welcome. In this place, we honor you, Lord. Oh, mama, 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 Oh, ma 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 na ra ka ba 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 ha na ra ka ba 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 ha. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, we worship you tonight. We bless your name. We praise your name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Mama, 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 Get all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, all the adoration, Lord God. Oh, my Lord God, we honor you, we bless you, Lord. We praise your name, we magnify you, Lord. There is none like you, there is none like you, Lord God. Oh, mama, 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 Thank you, Lord. Father, what a privilege 
What an honor to proclaim you as our king, the only risen king. You sit at the majesty of the throne on high. We proclaim you, Lord God Almighty. We thank you for your goodness, your loving kindness, that you won the victory. You plundered the enemy. And you did it all just for us. Oh, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord God, Most High. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We thank you that you manifest yourself in the lives of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. In our homes, in our business, in our affairs, in every situation. That you get the glory, the honor, and the praise forever and ever. And ever and ever. And ever and ever. You reign and you rule. And your dominion is forevermore. Adonai Jehovah. We bless your name. Adonai Jehovah. There is none like you. We proclaim you God. We proclaim you our King. We proclaim you our Savior. Our Lord. How excellent is your name in all of the earth. Thank you, Papa. Oh, we bless you. 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 If we had a thousand tongues, we cannot praise you enough. Oh, we bless your name. Thank you for being the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you for being the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and you are everything in between. We glorify your name. We exalt your majesty. Oh, hallelujah. Can we just do that song, Adonai? God, give him a shout. Hallelujah. 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 Glory.
Glory be to God. You may take your seats. Amen. His dominion is forever. And ever, and ever. Thank you, guys. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. This is the second week of this uh, Bradman Fast. Uh, we took off Saturday and Sunday from studying and <clears throat> coming together. And so tonight we go to John chapter 8. In order to get any, to get a flow from, I mean to get a flow for what we're going to share in John chapter 8, actually I need to begin from chapter 7 towards the latter part. Because he sets it up. <clears throat> Amen. Amen, Amen. Has God been good to anybody here? <laughs> I say, has God been good to anybody here? Yeah. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. John chapter 7. Let me just take the last few verses there to set it up for what we're going to cover in John chapter 8. Verse 37. The Bible says here, on the last day, the great... Let me start all over. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this is spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him will receive. I mean, since we started talking about this, do you guys see how many, how, how prominent the word believing is? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's like I'm reading my Bible all over again for the first time. It's, it's just amazing. All these promises are for those that believe. Okay. Verse 39, but this is spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, truly this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, would Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from a town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? <laughs> the officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. <laughs> then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have you, or rather, I'm sorry, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? In other words, they are trying to manipulate the people's thinking to think that what the Pharisees believed is what everybody else must believe. Verse 49. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus. He who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before he hears him and knows what he's doing? So you see in here that the visit at night, the seed that Jesus sowed in his heart, is already doing something. And this is important for you and I to know because when you share the gospel, you share something about God with people and they seem not to receive it on the instant, don't think that they didn't hear anything. While you are away from them, the Holy Spirit begins to deal with them and use the seed that's been sown to do something in them. And with all this believing stuff that we are learning, the Bible said to us very clearly that every seed will bring forth after its own kind. Amen? So you sow that seed and trust God for the result. Now, verse 52. They answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? You know, these guys turn, I mean, these Pharisees, they turn on Nicodemus. Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. That last verse on verse 53, John chapter 7, you may want to underline it. Everyone 
went to his own house. Now, John chapter 8, to this lesson. Verse 1. To show you that this is a continuity from the previous verse, let's read it together again. It says, and everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. After he made that huge statement where he told them, and the background to that in chapter 7 is the Feast of Tabernacles, and I don't want to get into any deep stuff tonight. But basically, it was a feast in Jerusalem whereby all the Jewish people come together for eight days around September, October to commemorate God's deliverance of them out of Egypt into the promised land. So every year, they were commanded in the law, Exodus 23, Leviticus 23, uh, no, Exodus 23, Leviticus 16, they were commanded every year, they were all to come together to Jerusalem and live on the streets in booths or tents and just remember how God delivered them and brought them out and just have a celebration for eight days. And the Jewish people were very faithful to all of the festivals of God. And every day they have different or various ceremonies during the eight days to commemorate the occasion. So in John chapter 7, on the last day of the feast, at a point where the priest, they will fetch water from a well and bring to the temple and pour out as part of the celebration. Jesus has been there all these seven days and on this last day, He's seen them going through all of these rituals and he couldn't take it any longer. He had this outburst where he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me to drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his bellies shall flow the rivers of living water. Whoa! Now, understand this is a setting of religious hierarchy. And this Galilean who has no title, who had no renown, no reputation, no great pedigree, interrupts their ceremony by giving his shout. And the Bible records for us that people took note of what Jesus said. And for those Pharisees, this was just a little too much. They've been looking for ways to get him. He's been really uh, challenging their thinking, their traditions. And now he did this at the temple. Huge deal. So there was a little division. Some said, well, this must be a prophet, man. For this guy to speak in this setting and say what he said and made this pronouncement, there's something to this guy. You need to, you need to watch him. Others said, this must be the Christ. And the Pharisees are hearing this. What, they are, what they've been trying to contain for months and years, now they're hearing people actually begin to acclaim that in fact this man must may be the prophet or the Christ, and this is the last thing they want to hear. So they're asking themselves, why have you not taken this guy in? Arrest him, bring him to custody. And the guys are saying, wait a minute, we can't touch this guy. We've never seen anyone like this before. And then, of course, Nicodemus steps out. We saw him in John chapter 3 in the closet. Now we see him in the public. Yes. So, wait a minute. Our laws does not condemn anyone until we've heard him. So, the chapter closed. By saying everyone went to his own house. Interesting enough though, chapter 8 opens, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. While men were sleeping, he was praying. See, the Mount of Olives was a place that he occasioned on a very regular basis. That was his place to go and decompress. That was the place for him to go and talk to God, to go and get new direction from God. He's told us already, John chapter 5, I can of myself own self do nothing. 
I have no plan. I have no agenda. I only download, receive, and follow the agenda of my father. But he has to spend the time. He has to create the time to get away with his father to receive whatever he's going to say in, in public. So here, while men went home, he went to be really home where he's best at home with his father. At the Mount of Olives. And this is going to be critically important to what's going to happen to him in the next few days. And we should all take cues from this. The strength of what we do, if it will last, will be determined not by how much we've studied, not by how much we know in our head, but by the strengthening that comes from the power of the Spirit. You see, it's one thing to do public ministry. It's another thing to have a private ministry. Yes. Nobody sees you. They don't know what's going on. You just come out yes, and you sir. speak some marvelous ridiculousness yes. and you go back into the hive. Yes, sir. I was privileged to meet, uh, um, what's his name? Brother Schamburg, old evangelist, way back. Uh, he died now. Oh, Schamburg, Brother Schamburg has been with the Lord now maybe about four or five years. Used mightily by God. Used mightily by God. Science wonders, powerful faith inspiring messages as an evangelist. Earlier on in ministry, a long, long time, when I first got born, they gave me about two, three years. I was in Detroit, Michigan, uh, with some friends. Actually, we were there for his crusade. We went there to be a part of his crusade. And we're sitting there in the restaurant eating. And by the wildest chance you can ever imagine, Shambag walks in. I mean, for a young believer, you do, I, I don't know how to describe it for you. I mean, I was besides myself. I was almost out of my skin. This is the real deal. This was in the afternoon, about 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The crusade was going to be at night at 7. And this guy sat alone eating this big old sandwich. I will never forget it. <laughs> I thought evangelists shouldn't eat before they preach. But... <laughs> And so I went to him and said, can we sit down with him? He said, oh, yeah, sure. So I began to prick his brain, and he was just talking openly. He was alone, no bodyguards, nothing. Nothing. No, I mean, just. And I asked him this question, and the thing stuck with me till then, till today. I wanted to know from him. I said, what is the greatest key to your success in ministry? Now, at this time, you must understand, you know a lot of people that have risen up, and then they fall. They rise and they fall. You don't see people that are sustained in ministry without scandals. Yeah. So I wanted to know, Brother Shambok, how have you managed to work with God this long with consistent result with no blemish? And then he told me the story. He told me how he went to this great crusade. God showed up big time. Deaf were, uh, ears were opened. The blind eyes opened. The lame walked. And because he was a man that loved people, after the meeting was over, he sat around, talked, hugged, fellowship. He got back to the hotel about 2 a.m. He said, son, I was so tired. When I got in that hotel room, he went to sleep in his suit and shoes on. That's how fatigued and exhausted he was. He said he had not been asleep 30 minutes. An angel woke him up. Shook him violently. Said, Shambag, what are you doing? He said, devil, leave me alone. <laughs> and tried to go back to sleep. And the angel shook him again. Shambag, what are you doing? And he yelled again, devil, are you deaf? I said, leave me alone. What do you think I'm doing? And of course, the voice came back the third time. I said, finally, he realized, wait a minute. If I rebook a devil once, that's enough. He shouldn't be coming back again. So it now occurred to him, this may not be the devil. And he said, the voice now told him, you've ministered to the people. What an affrontation and audacity that you give my glory to the people and minister to them. And you come back and you do not have the sense to know you have to minister to me. In other words, you've done public ministry. At the end of every public ministry, you need to come, you better get back in that closet and give glory, all the glory to God. 
all those things people said about you, how nice it was, how wonderful you are. Shamble, you have, we've never seen like You better go back in that closet and say, God, everything they said, I didn't receive from me, it's all yours. But not only that, be sure to be replenished in the, in the strength of your spirit man. Connect back with God. Let him replenish you, refreshing you. And on the strength of what you receive from that ministry with God, you can go back out to the street and minister back to God's people. Folks, this is the key here for everything Jesus did and everything we will ever do for him. In fact, whenever you see in your scripture, you hear the word or the term, eternal life. Right away, all of us think heaven, we live forever, da, da, da. And yes, there's some truth to all of that. There is some truth to that. You, you be in heaven, you, uh, you, you, uh, you live with God forever. All of that is true. But we're missing the big point. If the issue of eternal life is just being with God in heaven, why do you need it now? Oh, I know that's discussion for tonight. Did you hear what I just said? If all of eternal life is just talking about being with God and living in heaven, then you don't need it now. When you die, you pick it up. No. Eternal life is not just about heaven. It's not just being with God when we leave this realm. First of all, settle this for all time and eternity. Every human being that's ever lived on the face of this earth is alive right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, as everybody that's ever come to the earth, they may have left this realm, but they are alive as we speak. They're just in a different place. Good or bad, born again or unbelieving, they are just in different places. Okay? But the point I'm making, the essence of eternal life, when Jesus said, I've come to give you life, and life more abundantly, when he says in John chapter 3, that he that believes on the Son shall have everlasting life. It's not just the notion or the idea that we're going to be with him forever or that we're going to go to heaven. All of that is included, yes. But the more critical, important part is that we were created for God's pleasure and for his purpose. But in order to be able to activate that purpose and that pleasure in God, we have to have an intimate relationship with him. That's the essence of eternal life, that we come to know him in a very unique, intimate, and special way. That is the foundation of any message in the church. John 17, 3 defines eternal life. This is life eternal, that you may come to know him, the only true God, not Dagon, not Mammon, not Las Vegas, not anything else, that we may come to know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. That is the definition of eternal life. And that is the foundation for everything else. Relationship with God. I mean, learn about three steps on how to have a good marriage. But the three steps will not fully help me if I don't have the foundation of relationship with God. I may learn the three steps on how to prosper. And you may have superficial success doing that. But you will never have sustained success if you don't have the foundation of relationship with God. That's the difference. Everything we do, everything we are, must be on the foundation of the eternal or of the intimate relationship with God. Period. That's the only distinction between Christianity and any other religion. Christianity is the only religion or way of living that gives me and you access to know God. Yes. Islam cannot, they can't know they are Allah or God. They can't, they, they, there's no provision for that. Buddhism, Mormon, all of those guys, they have no access, no provision to ever get to know God. God says, I want you to know me. And that happens through our interaction with God. And that's what Jesus is doing here. You see, because I can teach you the keys of victory, the keys of warfare, and all, all of those things, and they have their place. But you will not be able to sustain those things if you don't 
have a relationship. I would dare to say tonight, 80% of the organized world church religion probably don't know God. As high as 80% of the people that profess to be Christians, that profess to be born again, that profess to have salvation, I want to almost say 80%, maybe even higher, have no clue who God is. If he came here riding a red horse on a white red shirt, they have no idea who he is. Much less about hearing his voice. You can forget that. That's a fact. But I want you to know, God's aching desire, the reason for which Jesus came is to bridge that gap, to bridge that gulf, to become the connection point between God in heaven and mankind. He wants to be known. He does not want to be shrouded in, in mystery or secrecy. That's why the Bible says in Psalms 103 that he made his ways known unto Moses. But the Israelites were content with just his acts. And that's my fear for the church, for the body of Christ. That we not just be content for the results we can get from God and don't want to have a relationship with him. Because you know what happened to the Israelites. They had results, but they perished. Huge. So, the issue of relationship with God is the crux, the foundation of everything that God did through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. By him, now we have access. All right, now let's move from there. Verse 2. I need to move very quickly now. All, now early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Now, isn't this amazing? This guy just ran away yesterday. They're looking for him. They want to kill him. They were divided on his Christ. He's a prophet. No. Let's get him. Let's arrest him. Now, he spent all night with his father. In spite of the background that yesterday, they were looking to put him out. And he walks right back in the same place. What, 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 where can a man get that kind of confidence? Walks right back in the same temple the next day. And all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Now, remember, he was never ordained as a rabbi among them. He, he did not have the status of the regular priesthood. But he had something that they didn't have. A relationship with the father. Okay? Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, so, so think about this now. When they went home like, that yesterday, while everybody was resting at home, these scribes and Pharisees, they were scratching their head, man, <laughs> we, we need to do something. While the rest of those guys were home, they were plotting. We need to devise a means to derail this guy. He's going to, listen, our career is on the line. If we don't put this guy out, we'll be out of business. While they were plotting, he was praying. While he was praying, they were praying. P-R-E-Y-I-N-G. He was praying for humanity. They were praying on humanity. And they found something now. And they brought this woman. And they said this woman was caught in adultery. That's not enough. We caught her in the very act. And they brought her. Right inside the temple. Can you imagine that distaste? In that public setting? Verse 5, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. 
first of all, this man had no legal or moral right to do what they are doing. Because if the woman was caught in adultery, where is the legitimate complaint of a husband? They didn't care about that. Okay. Verse 6, middle of verse 6. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now there are so many conjecture as to what Jesus wrote on the ground. So many different commentaries had so many different uh, things to say about this. Uh, but one of them that was very, very uh, significant is the Armenian manuscript. Uh, and what they said, and I'm going to tell you why we believe that that may be some kind of, kind of credence to that, was that in fact what Jesus was writing on the ground is perhaps the names of those accusers and the various sins, the various <laughs> women that they had been with and where it had happened. Uh, and, and we know that because in verse 8, the Bible says, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. That word wrote in that verse 8 is a word used to describe writing against. It's not just a matter of just writing like A, B, C. No. That word wrote there is a very specific Greek word to say that it's writing against. So whatever he was writing was against those men. Okay? Verse 9, the Bible says, those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. <laughs> and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now, I think it is very important for us to understand something. Uh, I think Dr. Norfolk, when he was ministering a few weeks back, mentioned about, about what the law. law is, it, the law is easy to quickly tell me and you where we've blown it. Right. And these Pharisees and scribes, they stand for the law. Mm -hmm. They found a woman caught in adultery. From the second they caught her, they were not concerned about what can we do to redeem this woman. They were not concerned about how can we help her to make the best of this bad situation. Their motivation from day one, from the instant they caught her was vindication, vindication punishment, reprimand, nothing about redemption at all. Be careful that you're not like that. I don't want us to just, just read these letters and just read it and just put it in an abstract somewhere. You need to bring it home to where you are. When the person is caught in a mistake, in a lie, in a, in a, in a bad life, so they've done something terrible, how, how do we respond? Do we gloat over the issue? Or are we broken in our heart and say, wow, I'm so sorry this happened to X, Y, Z. I wonder what we can do to help them come out of that. These guys were not thinking about that at all. For them, they were strengthened by, man, we got you, man. Not only did we get, we go, we get the woman, we're going to get Jesus. This is, this is a double. Yes. Now, remember John 1, 17? The law came through Moses, but what? Grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a consistent theme throughout the life of Jesus. Consistent. Because now in verse 10, the first thing he says to the woman, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Grace. Has no one condemned you? Grace. He can Jesus will consistently come out at you with grace. Consistently. Does that mean he condones the sin? No. Not by any means. But he will not deal with that first. First he gives you some grace so he can give you the truth. Consistently. Verse 11. She said, no, no one, Lord. And then Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. What? 
I'm just picturing in my mind, I don't know, maybe the lady was still in her underwears. Maybe she was even naked. I don't know. First, it deals with these evil-hearted accusers. Disperse them. Then he looks at the woman and says, where are the people that are accusing you? She said, no one, Lord. It's neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, let me, this is where I'm going to close tonight. Right there. Hear this. What is the distinction between the scribes and Pharisees and this, move, and this woman? When the scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus, they said, teacher. They only identified him as a teacher. But this woman, when Jesus said to her, where are your accusers? Who accuses? He said, no one, Lord. The Bible said no one can call the Jesus Lord except by the Holy Ghost. So this woman sits in this council. She's watching what's going on. Humiliated. How these guys want to put her lights out. Injustice. The whole nine yards. And she was expecting more of the same from Jesus. Because everything around her was, that's the way it was. But instead of seeing more of the same, she saw mercy love, goodness, kindness. And in that instant, the Holy Spirit said to her, this is not just a teacher, this must be the Lord. Because only by the Spirit can you call him Lord. Ah. And the last one I want to make to encourage all of us. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. Sin no more. So you see, this was not just a glossing over what happened. But what you need to see in the tone of Jesus saying this is what me and you must recognize today. That we, that's eluding many of us because we are so bent up and concerned about the things we do and don't, don't do. Right. Let, me tell, let, let me tell you what Jesus was saying to her. I'm not condemning you. You've called me Lord. So something from me has transferred to you already. So I don't condemn you. Go. And you're going. I'm walking in you. You will not sin anymore. Yes. Yes. He sent her away empowered not to go back to that lifestyle. That's something the law can never do. The law can tell you where we come short where we failed, where we didn't make it. But only Jesus can show us that with grace and give us the empowerment to overcome it. That's why he can say, go and sin no more. When the Bible talks about me and you being holy as God is holy, it's not telling me and you to go and engage in some activities that make us holy. Be ye holy as I'm holy. It's not telling me and you to go and engage in certain penance that's going to cause us to be like that. No. Is confident that because he's put the seed in us, that DNA is in you, he working in you, we bring the result he desires in you yes. as you cooperate with him. Yes. Huge difference. So the word to you tonight is to receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to know you are no longer under condemnation. And that you've been empowered by the Spirit of God to reproduce the God kind of life because he's placed that life in you. That seed is in you. It's not a corrupted seed, Peter tells us. But we must cooperate with it. We must yield to his prompting. And that's why it's important for me and you to be connected at Mount Olive, spending time with him in privacy and receive the strength, the direction, the enablement to go out and live the life just like him. We can do it. Not because we're doing it of our own. Paul said it right. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He said, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. This is the reason he died. 
so that it can be allowed, given access to live that life through us as we yield to him. On our own, we cannot do it. But thank God we don't have to do it on our own. He's here to help us, to do it and live it through us. In him we live and move and have our being. And so, Father, we thank you tonight. We receive of your grace and of your truth. We thank you. We thank you for this reoccurring theme that we see throughout your gospel of your love and your grace and your truth. So we receive of you grace for grace. And we thank you for the truth of the word of God because you said that when we abide in that truth, we continue in your word. We know the truth. And the truth that we know will set us free. So we receive liberty and freedom to live for God and be a blessing to God and honor you in our covenant relationship to the glory of your name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen, Amen. and good night.